If we go long today, it's because you all took so long hugging each other. <laughs> yeah. Bread of life. Thought about that? Saw it on the bulletin and said, well, that sounds boring enough. Ha, <laughs> Linz, I heard you laughing. <laughs> It's all about what feeds us, this bread of life thing. And on this Sunday, each year, as I said earlier, <coughs> we at Faith Family United Church of Christ commemorate Transgender Day of Remembrance as well as celebrate all that it means to be thankful for all that we have and have been given and have been asked to steward. And so we want to do both of those things. The Transgender Day of Remembrance commemoration actually began in 1998. Now, I know some of us are too young to remember that. But it was to honor the memory of Rita Hester, a transgender woman from Massachusetts who was killed in that year. And the person who started this is a transgender advocate named Gwendolyn Ann Smith who said this. With so many seeking to erase transgender people, sometimes in the most brutal ways possible, it is vitally important that those we lose are remembered and that we continue to fight for justice. Sometimes I think I'm preaching to the choir in this church. You know, I think, I think we get that. But do you also know that this year, in the first 11 months of 2016, 26 transgender people were killed? That's more than two a month. This is the United States of America. It's 2016. And yet that continues to happen. In all of last year, 24 LGBT people were killed by hate violence. 67% or two thirds of them were transgender and gender non-conforming people. Glad which is the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. I don't know if you've heard of it. They said that discrimination against marginalized groups has increased since the recent election and the March passing of the House Bill of House Bill 2 in North Carolina. I called and checked with another pastor, a friend of mine. She's part of the LGBT community. And I said to her, I saw in the news that four trans young people, students in school, committed suicide last week after the election. And she said, I saw that too, and I'm afraid it's true. There's a real heaviness to this day in some ways. And yet, despite what continues to happen to this particular group of folks in our country and world, and so far in 2016, over 200, there have been reported 295 deaths among the transgender community worldwide. But despite those terrible statistics, there's hope. My sense is, from folks I know, that not one trans person is going to choose to live without integrity because other people choose to live without integrity and threaten that person's welfare and their life. I think there's some real hope to be said by folks who insist they will be who they are. 
They will be who God created them to be and co-create with God who they will be in the future. And I find that incredibly hopeful. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of hard work for the rest of us. I don't know if you saw on Facebook or the news or some other media the safety pin project that's that's been going on. It's somewhat controversial. But it was intended to be to stand in advocacy for people who were made vulnerable by the election of officials that spoke against those folks. And so we're not only talking about homophobia and transphobia that folks need protection. We're also talking about things like Islamophobia. And we've been called on in the United Church of Christ and by our conference minister here in Florida to stand with the Muslim community in whatever ways we can. But again, in all that may frighten us, there is hope. Because God created us in God's image and likeness. In today's scripture we read, they said to him, what must we do for, to perform the works of God? What must we do to perform the works of God here in this place and space where we find ourselves in November 2016? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom God has sent. From the United Church of Christ, we believe the head of our church is Jesus Christ. So what does it mean for us to believe in the one whom God has sent? Does it mean we simply need to state our beliefs? Walking down the street, telling people what we believe? I don't do that so much. I don't know if you all do. I do put what I believe on my personal Facebook page. Do we need to state what we believe publicly? We just tell our friends. Are we called to action beyond our words? When we are called to believe in the one whom God has sent? And if so, what is that action for us? Did you ever stop your car when you were driving down the street because you saw kids bullying another kid? Did you ever get out of your car, take that risk, try to scatter those kids that were bullying the loner, the misfit, the one who was probably more like me than I know? I can't remember doing that. I was younger, smaller, faster. <laughs> so what do we do today? Wearing a safety pin says to other people, I'm going to stand between this person who's vulnerable and somebody who wants to threaten him or her. I'm going to sit next to that person on the bus, on the train, on the plane, on the whatever, so they know that it's safe to sit next to me, both in word and deed. There are 
are so many ways in our days that this will happen to us. And it's up to us what we do with the opportunity to believe in the one whom God has sent us. But I'm hopeful. And part of the reason I'm hopeful is that I pastor this little church called Faith Family United Church of Christ, and I know every person in it, or I will get to know them. And I know I can count on the goodness and the integrity of everybody here. To in whatever way you are able, and we are able, to stand up against anyone being bullied because she or he is different. I suspect some of us were bullied in life as young people in situations where people had authority over us and sometimes bullied us. We're all in a position to do something. And if you're 80 years old and use a walker, as some of our folks do, probably that is to pray. For all of us, it is to pray. And for some of us, it is to do more. Jesus then said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Abba, who gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's that time of year when we like to eat a lot. And so, I've actually been to people's houses where they said, here, I made this for you, take this home. Here, I made this for you, take this home. None of it's on the top ten list that my doctor said, these are things I don't want you to eat. <laughs> and I eat them just because I want to be kind to those people who have given them to me. <laughs> But here's what I know. What feeds me is not the peppermint candy or the caramel candy. Those are two things I got this week. That's not what feeds me. What feeds me is the love that went into making that and all the work that went into making sure it was delivered or gotten to me. That's what feeds me. I think this bread of life that feeds the world is something we can look at in a few ways. I think first of all, it's food for the body, this bread of life. It is food for the body. If it weren't food for the body, why would we be collecting food to take to Eka. If it weren't food for the body, why would we keep that food pantry stocked? If it weren't food for the body, why would we put on our sign out there, come to our yard sale and get free food? So part of it is food for the body because you know what? God doesn't want anybody to be hungry. The last mission we had that poster is still on the wall, soon to be replaced by our Christmas poster for by our children. But the poster on the wall says, so that no child goes to bed hungry. And I don't know about you, but I would have to say that from the littlest time that I began to understand that, when I went to church school as a little Catholic kid, 
Remember the kid, the starving kids in India back in the 50s? How many remember the starving kids in India? I know, Lynn, you weren't born yet. The starving kids in India, right? Do you remember being told, you must eat the peas on your plate because there are starving kids in India that would love to have those peas on your plate. God doesn't want anybody to be hungry. And so we do what we can so that people don't go to bed hungry. That's why we did one great hour of sharing. That's why we did Neighbors in Need. And that's why we will do the UCC Christmas Fund. I also think that bread for the world and food for us means food for our hearts. Because God wants none of us, none of God's beloved children, to lose heart. And Sandy, I know you almost lost heart. I know that was hard. It's still hard. We have a neighbor who refuses to take down his yard side because I told him I took it personally. <laughs> we'll probably be there the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> God doesn't want us to lose heart. If you remember, we at Faith Family United Church of Christ, we were born out of a resistance not to lose heart. Some of us have been here for all seven years, and it doesn't matter whether you have or haven't. But if you were here from our earliest days, you know we were born out of a resistance not to lose heart. No matter what somebody said about us, what losers we were, what losers you were to have a pastor like me. And I'm sorry, that happened. <laughs> we got the better deal. We were born out of a resistance not to lose heart, and we have not lost heart. And the very first day we met until this very day, and all those days in between, the one thing we have been consistent about is that whoever comes to our doors comes through doors of extravagant welcome into a place of sanctuary. That here you will not need to be afraid. That here no one will threaten you that here no one will mock or deride you or your family or however you choose to live yourself with your family. Here you will find sanctuary. How do I know that? Because I know you guys. And there's nobody here that's not about making sure everybody here is safe and can have and find and be in sanctuary. And I think bread for the life means food for our souls. God wants our souls to be fed to overflowing. With what? God's love. What does it come? It comes from Jesus, the one whom God sent. Sent as what? This big warrior king? No. This vulnerable infant child promising only not to lead us into battle but promising only to be Emmanuel God with us always and forever. When our souls are fed we can then feed other souls. <clears throat> and we have lots of souls to feed, don't we, Sandy? We have all those souls to feed who right now at this moment might feel hollowed out because someone thinks they're not important. <laughs> We're always going to be a church that has free food, free clothing, and anything else we can figure out that we can do. I think most of all, sanctuary. Because we want everybody's soul to know that here, here, God is here. <coughs> Thank you.
And then the folks said to Jesus, Teacher, give us this bread always. I thought that was kind of bold. That's what we used to say when I taught Catholic school. That's bold. Give us this bread always. Really? And Jesus says to them, despite this demand, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And think about all the other ways we try to satiate whatever our hunger is. None of which satiate our hunger. And so we run away from God and we run to all the things we run to for diversions. I have a lot of diversions. I don't know what yours are. But I'll tell you what I won't do again, and that is take Mary on a gambling boat. <laughs> <laughs> it took us 10 minutes to spend a hundred and some dollars, and I'm not kidding. And then we're on the boat, and we can't get off for an hour. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I don't care what diversion I need. You know, I've been, I've been in the desert in my life. Have y'all been in the desert? You know what the desert is? The place where you're feeling dry, you can't quench your thirst, no one's feeding you, you're all alone. It's a pretty scary place to be. And it's pretty much a spiritual desert. It, it's not necessarily a physical desert, unless some of you have been to a physical desert. I mean, I was at Palm Springs when it was 120 there, but that to me is different. I was looking for Diana Shore. She wasn't around it. <laughs> Too far away from that the water. That gives your age away, Dick. Well, that's, that was her golf course we went to visit. <laughs> but in the spiritual deserts I've experienced in life, when I thought I was running away from all that was making me crazy, which pretty much in my life I always blamed God for. And I was like, God, stop doing that to me. Stop making me crazy. What I discovered was for every step I took, for every pace I ran, God was keeping up with every one of those. I wasn't running alone. And I don't think you were either if you found yourself in those places. Because here's the thing. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. I think Jesus takes and enlarges that so that we get in all this transformation that we become the whoever, right? Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. You among that whoever? Is that a yes? Yes. yes? But I also think as Jesus enlarges and transforms that, we become in that verse Jesus. We become what we say a lot Jesus' hands and Jesus' heart in this world. And we become those who then feed the rest of the whoever. That's who we are. And so on this day that we celebrate Thanksgiving, for yeah. our God, we give thanks. For one another, look around at each other. For one another, look around at yourselves. Look around, we give thanks. For our call to be Jesus' hands and heart in our community and world, we give thanks. Might be grudging at times, but we give thanks. For receiving for ourselves and for becoming for others the bread of life, we give thanks. Amen.